Yes. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ellen Hannock with the Public Policy Institute of California. I'm the director of the Water Policy Center. We are delighted to have you all here in the room with us and on the, on the webcast. Hi. Um, I'm going to kick off with just a, a little bit of housekeeping. What do I need to tell you? Um, please silence your cell phones. Um, and we're going to have a survey at the end of this event. Um, well, actually, later today, you'll get, you'll get a survey in the email. For, by email form, please fill it out if you can. It's just a short thing that helps us to give, give us feedback on our events and make them better. So we really appreciate the feedback. Um, and you have with you your, the, the program, um, which I'm going to run through you, for you in a minute. Um, but you also have an, uh, an overview of, the, of this new study. In the back, there are hard copies of the, the full report, but it's also available online along with a whole bunch of appendices and everything. So there's a lot of material online. There's also a Spanish language version of the overview report. Um, so there are a lot of, lot of different ways that we're trying to make this information available and accessible to folks. So, so please enjoy it in whatever form. I think we also have a video on our website about it. and. Um, and so I think maybe I'll just start by telling you a little bit about the, the program and, and the study. Um, so th this is a, a, an effort that was underway for a few years and it, with a, a large team of funders that supported it. I want to acknowledge all of them, the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, the Tomcat Foundation, USDA, and the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Water Foundation. And we also have a, a large team of authors that I'm going to show you in a minute, introduce, introduce to you, and a lot of folks who've been advising us. Um, we, this is the third in a, in a series of reports looking at challenges in the, in the San Joaquin Valley and some of the, the solutions. And um, we're very excited about the conversations that have been underway as we were doing this work, but also since the report came out about a month ago. We kicked it off with a half day event in Fresno where at, at, on the Fresno State campus. Fresno State has been a, a key partner on, on this work. And that discussion included panels with a lot of folks from around the valley to talk about some of the challenges and some of the solutions. And today we're in Sacramento and we have a chance to look more at the state and federal side of things um, and sort of where the state and federal governments can help. So we've got a dynamite panel um, which is going to include Secretary of Agriculture Karen Ross, Secretary of Natural Resources Wade Crowfoot, and one of the senior folks from the USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service here in California, Tom Hett, to talk about what their agencies and more broadly um, the, the state and federal governments can, can do. And that's going to be moderated by Sarge Green, my colleague from Fresno State, who's been a, a, a wonderful a key member of this team. So I'm going to kick it off with just a, a little bit of an overview of some of our our key findings for you, and then we'll we'll move into the panel discussion. And oh, I, I should say when we are having the the Q and A, because we're going to do that toward the end of the panel discussion, we're going to ask you because it, it is a webcast um, event to wait and get the mic. One of my colleagues will bring around a microphone for you. Thank you. Okay, so here is the the team, the author team. Some of them are here in the room today, and 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 other others. Um, many of you probably know this was a, a, an interdisciplinary team that worked together over, over these several years on this project, including folks from, in addition to Fresno State and PPIC, also UC Davis, UC Merced, and Point Blue Conservation Science. And we also got help from a lot of folks uh, along the way. This is, I would say, in a way, a partial list. Um, this includes people who were members of a, an informal advisory group that met uh, on a uh, probably a couple times a year in Fresno to kind of sit around the room and bounce ideas off, off of us and, and get, give us feedback on our work underway. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Vernon Crowder, who's here in the room, who I, I think gets the gold star for attending all of those meetings and, um, and was both at the Fresno event and is here today. Vernon is, was with Rabobank when, he, when we started out this project as a hard-nosed economist 
um, advising on agricultural uh, economy issues, and now he is with the Kings River Conservancy, so looking, looking more at some of the, the ecological uh, management side of things. Um, but we also, in addition to the folks on the advisory council, we got, we got really helpful input from folks uh, who were able to provide reuse of our work and, and, and so on. So, so this, this includes them, and, and just wanted to acknowledge and thank them for the, for the, the time and input. Um, do not blame them for anything that you, you don't like in the report. That's all on us. Um, they probably gave us, uh, gave, advised us not to say it if you really don't like it. And, um, and if there are good ideas, they probably were suggestions from folks in this list. So, um, so the, 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 key, the key message of this report is that the, the San Joaquin Valley is really at a pivotal moment. This is the state's largest agricultural region for a long time now, has been producing more than half of the, the farm gate value of, of crops and animal products in California in dollar terms. Um, and it faces just a lot of challenge on the waterfront and, and some related um, issues and as well as some inevitable change. It's a region full of very creative folks so um, it, who've been used to adapting to challenges as, and opportunities as they come along. Um, we thought that it could be useful to help take a look at uh, some of these, these issues and challenges and, and help to identify some of the most promising solutions. And what we, what we find is that there are promising approaches to uh, uh, tackling some of the challenges that, that lie ahead. The themes that you're going to hear over and over again are ways to increase flexibility and how we manage water and how we want manage related land resources ways to provide incentives so that growers who are going to be some of the key decision makers in this on the ground are, are able to, to do this in ways that make business sense for them, and then ways to leverage multiple benefits or to kind of stack benefits um, of different actions so that you, you get more than, than one thing out of it an, an individual product. Maybe you get groundwater recharge and you get some wetland habitat, for example. Maybe you get some flood protection along with saving water for use in some other parts of the, of the region. Increased coordination and cooperation are going to be absolutely fundamental to implementing these various solutions um, that, that I'm going to talk about. And we, we emphasize that it's really important for folks in the Valley to be taking the leadership role on this. This is, uh, you know, they're, they're the ones who are, are, are living and working with these challenges on a day-to-day -day basis, but the state and federal governments can both play very important roles, and we're going to have a chance to dig into that a bit more uh, as we go along. So key challenge that everyone has top of mind, I think, in the San Joaquin Valley is the, the long-term challenge of groundwater overdraft. And with um, changes in, in law now in California, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, this is now a requirement for, for folks at the local level to bring their basins into long-term balance. We did some analysis just to kind of look big picture valley-wide at the, the extent of this challenge. And what we find is a long-term overdraft of almost 2 million acre feet a year. Uh, what this figure shows you is just the change in the overall net groundwater balance from year to year. If it's red and below that line, that means that there's been a net drawdown in groundwater in that year. If it's blue and above the line, that means that there's been a net increase in groundwater. This is going to be one of those blue years because it's really wet. That, that, those blue years tend to only happen when it's really wet. Um, and the red years happen even more when it's really dry, but they've been happening too much when it's just kind of in between too. And so the, the challenge for the valley is going to be finding ways to, to, to make this ultimately go away. It doesn't mean getting rid of the variability. There's still going to be a need to use groundwater more in dry years, but finding ways to make more blue years. Uh, basically, uh, as part of this equation. And so thinking about, I mentioned the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. This is a law that was uh, enacted in the, in the midst of California's historic drought. Uh, this was in September 2014 that it came together. Um, what, what it requires relates to this map that you see up here. Um, these, are, these are sort of priority basins for uh, for management under the under the act, anything that is yellow or orange there are these are basins that, under the law, have to form agencies, groundwater sustainability agencies, and develop groundwater sustainability plans that 
and start implementing them so that over a 20-year horizon, they bring the basins into balance, and they meet a number of other sustainability criteria, including making sure that they're not harming water, water quality, addressing land sinking, many of the, the kinds of impacts that, that come from not managing a groundwater basin well have to be addressed as part of these plans. And the bright orange areas, those are areas that are, those are basins that are considered critically overdrafted in the Department of Water Resources records on this. Those are basins where folks have to meet a tighter timeline than in the other priority basins. They, uh, basically, those plans are going to be on the street in public review form by this summer, and they're going to have to be delivered in final form to the Department of Water Resources in January 2020, with implementation starting right away. So this is, you can see most of this orange, this big sea of orange is the San Joaquin Valley. The region that we're looking at includes the, the areas that, ha that are within the San Joaquin River hydrologic region and the Tulare Lake hydrologic region. The effects of coming into balance are going to vary from place to place, but the basic math is kind of simple. And it's that either if you're, if you're pumping too much relative to the long-term average of staying in balance, you've got to either reduce the amount you're pumping or add more water um, to, 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 to this equation. So one of the key things that we look at is how to, how to balance supplies and demands. That's, that's sort of, sort of main, the, main, the main challenge that folks are facing. And they're going to have to do it at the local level. It's easier, actually, to, to look at this from, from a very big picture uh, level like we did than it is to, to do this down at the local level. But folks are hard at work on, on, at, on that. And I'll say impacts will vary across the region in part because there are some basins that are more out of balance now. Um, the drier part of the San Joaquin Valley, the Tulare Lake region, has a greater Im imbalance right now. But what we find, I'm going to show you, is that actually some trading of water within the region could really help lower the cost for the region as a whole in terms of management. And so um, depending on how much of that happens and how much recharge happens and so on, that could change the sort of regional pattern of where, where, where demand has to be managed and where the impacts will be felt. So in addition to bringing supply and demand into balance, the Valley faces a number of other linked challenges related to water quality, air quality, and habitat. Uh, just touch on this really quickly um, uh, to give you an, an intro to it. Nitrate in groundwater, which especially comes from agricultural activity, from, from the use of fertilizer and, and manure uh, on fields, that creates risk to drinking water. Salinity is a big challenge in this region on the west side. That's especially a, an, an issue for agricultural productivity. Poor air quality is a, an issue partly just by the nature of the geography of this basin with mountains on both sides. But there's a concern that if land, more land is going to be coming out of production in order to bring the groundwater basins into balance, that that could increase dust and, and make air worse. And there's also just challenges that the dairy industry is having to face on uh, in terms of air quality, but also methane emissions management. And then the, the, this is a region with a highly altered environment. We, we often hear about the water issues and the challenges of, of sort of trade-offs in the delta uh, on ecological management, but there are also just challenges on the land side, uh, especially um, in, this, in the southern part of the region. The, the San Joaquin Desert um, ecosystem has a lot of endangered species and threatened species that are, that are, that are part of everyday concern for, for balancing the land management. So I'm going to touch on these three areas that we talk about in the report in more depth. First is balancing supplies and demands. Second is addressing some of the key groundwater quality challenges. And then the third is fostering beneficial water and land transitions. And by this third one, we're really thinking about how do you kind of make lemonade out of, out of some of the lemons um, here in terms of, of thinking about opportunities for, for managing the resources in ways that can be good for people and also good for nature. So on the supply side and on the demand side, bringing supplies and demands into balance, there are a lot of different ways to, to reduce overdraft. And you know, I mentioned the math of increasing supplies or reducing demands. This is this little pie chart just shows you that that red portion is the part that's going to have to be eliminated over time, and it can be eliminated by adding water or by using less water. Um, and so we looked at pretty much everything that was out there in terms of studies on different options for 
managing supplies and augmenting supplies and different options for managing demand. The ones that are highlighted in red here are the ones that we looked at with detailed numbers. We talk about the other ones as well, just to give, give folks a sense of what, what that entails. And there's a lot there, for those who are really interested, Appendix B and Appendix C um, give you all the details <laughs> that you might want, and D, I should not forget D. Um, <laughs> and that was all work led by my, my colleague Alvaro Escribao and, and Josue Medellin Azuar from UC Merced. Um, and a, a real labor of, of love of numbers and, and trying to get the right answers. Um, so I'm just gonna give you sort of the, you know, super condense what we find. And what we find is that there are a lot of options for augmenting supplies. Um, we looked in, you know, a range of different categories. These groups here kind of include a lot of different kinds of projects in, in some different categories of capturing and storing more local runoff from the watershed, increasing local runoff, meaning managing the forest headwaters to increase the amount of water running into the basin, increasing delta imports through various kinds of projects, um, reducing exports to other regions like Southern California, and then, then some, some, some others that don't yield nearly as much potential water. The blue bar here shows you physically how much might there potentially be if you did everything. Um, and then the orange shows you what might farmers be able to afford, given the costs of these approaches and the fact that farmers generally are not going to want to spend more than three to five hundred dollars an acre foot long term for water because they've got to make it work in their businesses. And what we find, you see that the the orange, the the, ye the yellow, the bright yellow there is much smaller than the blue. Um, and it's mainly focused on this capture and store mo more local runoff. This is especially likely to be in the, in the realm of increasing groundwater recharge, but also making the system of storage reservoirs and conveyance and groundwater basins work together in a more integrated way so that you can maximize the storage. So um, that, that is the, the best hope. And then there's also some room for increasing imports through some some investments and especially from remanaging the system. We estimate that overall maybe there's about a quarter of that deficit um, that can be filled affordably by farmers. Now, the other piece of it is going to be demand management. And what we emphasize here is that it really matters a lot how you manage demand. I just say from the start that making your irrigation systems more efficient is not really, that has a lot of uses. Very, very relevant for productivity, for water quality, and so on, but it's not the great solution for bringing your groundwater basins into balance because it t tends not to change how much the crops are actually consuming. And when you're more efficient with irrigation, it means you're recharging less or sending less back, back into the drainage ditch for somebody else to use. So what really the tools that farmers mainly have here on the demand management side are either shifting to crops that consume less water, and there's a bit of that that's likely to happen, or taking land out of production on the least productive fields and on the least productive crops. And so what I'm showing you here are some different scenarios where we, we model that and we allow farmers to make smart decisions from their perspective to, to maximize their profits while they're doing it. So the first scenario is super inflexible water use. And that's the idea that in any given basin, um, every farmer has to just proportionally reduce every crop that they've got um, by the same amount. Say if the basin has to reduce by 25%, 25% of everything. That gives you crop revenue losses on an average annual basis of about $3.5 billion. Um, and it leads to following of about 780,000 acres out of a baseline of about 5.2 million acres of irrigated land. The next one, the orange, that is when you introduce local flexibility. So you allow flexible water use within basins, within the, the groundwater basins, and that means farmers are trading groundwater and surface water and moving it to the most productive fields and crops. That reduces the costs by nearly half. You go down to the losses go down to about two million, sorry, two billion a year. Um, it also reduces the, the following a, a little bit because of crop shifting. The next one, the, or, the yellow, that is allowing valley-wide surface trading as well, encouraging that. So just within the valley, San Joaquin Valley, we're not talking about including rice growers in the Sacramento Valley, just within the valley, meeting that budget, but allowing water to move from basically from the wetter San Joaquin River region to the Tulare ba uh, Basin uh, in, in cases where it makes economic sense both for the sellers and the buyers. 
you reduce the costs again by quite a bit. So you're, we're now down to about one third of the revenue losses that we would have had with inflexible water use. And you also shift the, you know, reduce fouling a little bit. Now that blue, that's sort of the sweet spot from our analysis. That's kind of the optimal portfolio where you're adding in this 25% of new supplies that farmers at affordable prices for farmers and you're doing all of this flexible water management. And that gets you down to just 25% of the crop revenue losses that you would have had with no new supplies and with inflexible water use. And that also, you can see, really does reduce the land fallowing. That gets you down to about 535,000 acres of land fallowing. So you know, about, about a 25% jump downwards in land fallowing. So that's kind of what we focus on, is how to get to that. And we're not saying that that's the, the magic formula, that this is exactly what's going to happen on the ground. We fully expect there to be innovation and people to figure out creative ways to, to do things. But this is kind of the, the, the basic idea of combining flexible management of demand and affordable supply management. And this is just to show you that we also looked at beyond crops, what happens to the rest of the economy, the regional economy, looking at animal production, dairy and beef are both big in the valley, as well as processing. The animal production is the, the red and the yellow is the, the processing. And this, this basic idea works very well for the broader economy, not just for the crop economy. So it's important for jobs, it's important for GDP of the region as well to, to think about smart strategies for managing supply and demand. The other thing that's important is this idea of a glide path, of kind of getting there gradually rather than on February 1st of 2020, expecting everybody to end overdraft overnight. That would be very costly for the region. And folks are planning with this in mind of thinking about gradual. And uh, we say that's important to do, but it's also important to do that and thinking about mitigation of things like impacts you might have on domestic drinking wells, things like that, so that you're not causing harm to others while you're doing this. So priorities for action. And I'm just going to walk through these really fast because I think the panel is going to address these in, in more detail. And we're start, we've started here some of the areas where we think especially the state and the federal governments can help a lot. Assessing infrastructure needs and modernizing operations, that's going to be key for effective supplies. Incentivizing recharge on farmland, um, that's a, an untapped area really. Developing local water trading rules and a healthy local trading culture. This for the state, clarifying how much water is available for recharge. Facilitating approvals for trading and banking, that's especially a state and federal kind of thing because they own and operate a lot of the infrastructure. And then for everybody really coordinating to maximize the benefits. So water quality, just tee up a few things for you here. Um, this is something that's going to have to be addressed in while Sigma is happening and while folks are trying to address their water balance. Uh, we focus especially on some new areas of regulatory, fo regulatory focus, providing safe drinking water, managing nitrogen loading, and managing the salt balance. This shows you a picture of a long process that um, of about 10 years of stakeholders trying to work on tackling some of these things, the CB salts effort, um, and there's a a new pr um, plan that uh, for, for up an updated water quality plan for the region that the regional board has approved on salt and nitrate management that addresses safe drinking water as well. This is going to come before the state board very soon too. We, we like we like this plan. Uh, we think that it has a lot of uh, a, a lot of the things that are important for the region. Um, what's important, especially, is that the valley is a hot spot for safe drinking waters. The California's statewide safe drinking water crisis. Uh, we highlight the valley counties here just to show you that at least half of the communities that lack safe drinking water are in the valley. Um, that's the the left side map. The right side map is communities that suffered uh, supply shortages during the drought. And for, for dry wells, it was about 80% of those reported were in the valley and about half of the small community systems that had supply challenges. So this is clearly ground zero for addressing this issue. Um, the dair dairies in the valley, it's, it's vying with almonds as the, the biggest, industry, biggest ag industry in the valley. Um, they are facing special challenges in managing nitrogen, so they're going to need special solutions. This map just shows you side by side where the dairies are and where the hot, sp hot spots are for ongoing nitrogen loading. Almost 90% of the lands with the highest levels of uh, nitrate, nitrogen loading in the valley are dairy croplands. And that's just because it's very hard to manage manure uh, 
efficiently, and really there's too much manure relative to the amount of dairy land. So folks are looking at solutions to get it off of the, get it, get some of that manure off of the lands. Salt is a big, another big challenge. Um, everything that's red there are areas where crop productivity is, is at risk, and this is an increasing challenge. Um, there are a number of ways to, to deal with this. Some of the big solutions like desal are expensive and probably too expensive for valley farmers. Um, probably some additional lands are going to come out of production over time because of salt. We're suggesting really thinking about coordinating how that happens with land that might come out of production because of, of the water balance to make sure that we're not taking lands out that, that are, are as productive as possible. And then this is, a, this is a little wheel showing you crops that are on suitable lands for recharge. Uh, about half of the valley's cropland has at least, good, at least moderately good conditions for recharging groundwater on the lands. Uh, about a quarter of them, the dark blue, those are clean crops that don't have a lot of nitrogen and where you can recharge without a lot of concern. That whole yellow, uh, sorry, the whole um, green area down there, that green half, those are crops that use nitrogen fertilizer but that could be managed in order to, to recharge well. So this is going to be a big challenge for farmers as they're managing quality and quantity together. And it's an area where we think in particular um, the but both a couple of our panelists will have some useful things to say about this, I hope. But this is where the ag, the USDA and CDFA can both be really helpful in in terms of of uh, finding solutions for growers on this. Um, so priorities for action, a whole lot of the, the the things that I just said, but you know, especially providing safe and reliable drinking water, and on the on the state and federal side, um, providing regulatory flexibility to manage nitrogen and salt loading in ways that recognize that it's, sometimes it might get worse before it gets better if you're going to recharge on lands that already have uh, nitrogen in the, in the root zones. So finally, just to touch on this idea of fostering beneficial water and land use transitions, a lot of uh, challenges in the valley relating, relating to water and land management alongside ecosystems that are under stress and I think a lot of concerns that land that might come out of production could make air quality worse, um, make conditions worse for neighboring farmers because of pests and weeds. Um, but what we also find is that there's a potential for thinking about these lands strategically in ways that can get you multiple benefits, including some revenues for farmers as well as some benefits for the broader, uh, broader society and for the environment. And things like healthy soils, that can also get carbon storage credits potentially, habitat, solar, wildlife friendly solar is even a possibility now, recharge, flood protection, recreation, you name it, are potential, but these are things that are not going to happen unless we think about it intentionally. And what this wheel shows you is just that so far the planning processes that have been done for the valley don't go near these kinds of amounts of land in terms of thinking about what might happen. So the the big yellow part are sort is sort of the land that's not even thought about in any of the kinds of plans for restoration of the San Joaquin Desert, for solar, for riparian and floodplain lands and, and intermittent wetlands and, and groundwater recharge. So what we really need to be doing is thinking bigger about this so that we can get benefits from stewarding all of these lands. And the priorities here include planning, thinking about doing this in a coordinated rather than a farm by farm way. We say this is especially important for folks in the Valley to do, but we think that the state and federal partners could be helpful here. Uh, flexible regulatory approaches to restoration are going to be really important, and this is a, especially a state and federal role. Um, funding and incentives, um, definitely there are funds available. There is probably potential for more from local, from state, from federal pocketbooks. Um, and there's a potential for really getting a lot out of, of pooling these funds. And then um, I just want to give a little shout out to USDA because we're going to have Tom on the, on the panel um, that USDA is one of these quiet partners that can really pack a punch uh, on the ground and has a, the confidence of farmers. And um, you know, in the Valley, about 50 million go to conservation funding every year on average. And, and we think there are a lot of creative ways to help with groundwater recharge more as well as with some of these land stewardship things. Um, I just want to say that farmers can play an important role in this also by bringing their ag knowledge to how do you do restoration on a large scale. And this kind of just gives you an example of that. 
in some uh, riparian ha habitat renovation. And uh, technical support, this is another area where federal and state entities can be really important. We're highlighting here in the map that the valley doesn't have much, uh, nearly as much presence from, regional, uh, from resource conservation districts as it could, but that's also true for other things. And I know that's near and dear to Karen's heart. So I wanna make time for the panel, so I'm just gonna wrap up here and say, um, there's a lot of work to be done, but there's, there's a lot of potential here too. And um, we're very excited to have a chance to hear from our great panel. So Sarge and panelists, come on up. And I'm gonna introduce Sarge while you are making your way up. Um, Sar Sarge Green is, come, come on, you, you can, <laughs> don't be shy, don't be shy. Sar Sarge, Gr Sarge Green is uh, the, has many hats. Actually, I, I can't introduce you properly because I don't know all your hats uh, from day to day, but, but he's, he's a pillar of uh, San Joaquin Valley water management, and he knows, I think, everybody in the valley, too. So whenever we would have a question about anyone, he'd say, oh, yeah, you know, you would know them. So, um, so we're, it's been delightful to work with you, and I'm going to hand this now over to you and have at it. Thank you very much, Ellen. Thanks for the kind remarks. Um, I'm going to do the introductions. I think most of you know these people, so we're going to be brief. Uh, uh, if you need their bio, I think it's been handed out. Uh, first on uh, my right is uh, Thomas Hett, State Resource Conservation with the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service in Davis, I assume, right? Uh, yes. Headquartered there. And of course, Secretary Karen Ross, Karen. Uh, and then uh, Secretary of California Food and Agriculture, Wade, good to see you again too, uh, Secretary of the Natural Resources, both, uh, well, Wade, you're new in the Newsom administration, Karen's carrying over, but I think you had some roles in the prior administration I too, I, yeah. think. <laughs> I saw you around quite a bit. So, did. <laughs> so uh, anyway, the goal of this particular panel is to discuss some of the possible assistance that the state and federal government could put to use on in terms of the social, economic, and environmental issues under the transition we're going to see with the Sustainable <coughs> Groundwater Management Act. I, I think what we'd like to point out is that we're now perhaps in a perpetual crisis of drought in the San Joaquin Valley. We had a lot of assistance during the last drought, and now we probably lost a little bit of that inertia, and we probably need to pick it up again. But that's because we've been investing heavily probably in the in the day-to-day -day things of trying to uh, understand the implications and or do the work necessary to, to meet Sigma. So now we're ready to uh, discuss what are we going to do in the way of future assistance. And the balance is uh, to find both sustainability in terms of water supplies, but then to provide adequate drinking water and uh, solve some of the other water quality challenges that uh, will probably be highlighted uh, as well in the uh, reports coming out very soon. I mean, we were talking about some of the drafts are starting to show up right now. So the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act will have uh, a considerable impact on our future in the valley. And those of us from the valley, obviously we'll need to take a, a pretty strong lead in, in trying to get things implemented to assist ourselves but then there is the opportunity to partner with both the state and federal government. And so that's what I'm going to ask the panel today is to talk a little bit about what are some of the opportunities uh, that we can possibly enjoy in trying to uh, solve these problems. So uh, in general, I'm going to start with uh, Wade and Karen, and I'll go Wade first. Um, during that drought, there was lots of coordination, cooperation, investment, and uh, a lot of information was exchanged. And, and so what were the lessons learned during that drought that you could perhaps then, in your new uh, roles or on, <laughs> ongoing roles in your case, Karen, what, what is it that we could apply or use from that that we have, uh, that we can now uh, uh, perhaps uh, address some of these issues? Thanks, Sarge. <clears throat> and thanks to P PIC for, for both holding this forum and, and for doing this report. Um, it's clear that our water challenges are mounting under climate change and hydrology is becoming less certain. Different parts of the state will experience the, our water challenges differently, but perhaps no place uh, experiences as acute water challenges right now as the San Joaquin Valley. So uh, acknowledging PPIC for really digging in on this, spending time in the valley uh, with leaders like Sarge, actually working through what are the challenges, but more importantly, what are, what are the solutions? 
Um, and I think this is a roadmap, actually, for, for us at the state. So I want to acknowledge that and, and appreciate uh, the work that went into this. Um, <clears throat> I think lessons learned from the drought maybe are, I, I'd, I, I'd highlight two. Um, one is um, that different communities in different parts of the state have different vulnerability. Um, and what we realized in the drought and we realized in, in real time during the drought is some communities um, have very uh, tenuous water security. In other words, they rely on uh, groundwater with really shallow wells. And when the drought occurs and groundwater pumping intensifies, um, communities, hundreds of communities literally ran out of water. Uh, and believe it or not, some of those communities are still receiving emergency tanks of water and, and don't have their, uh, their groundwater uh, systems back up and running providing water. Um, and so, you know, one is to focus resources <clears throat> where the vulnerability is greatest. And that's why I think to date, the Department of Water Resources in focusing its uh, Sigma implementation resources has focused heavily on the San Joaquin Valley. Um, parts of the San Joaquin Valley, as you know, are entirely reliant on groundwater. Um, so it's not a question of balancing surface water that you get every year in groundwater. It's literally uh, depending on groundwater that you obviously have to use less of on an annual basis. Um, and the second big takeaway for, for me from the drought was um, the importance of working with local communities and governments um, and water agencies, uh, maybe most relevantly, uh, because state government actually doesn't have the solutions. Uh, we have the resources. Uh, our legislators in the Capitol have the power of making new laws. The governor has emergency powers. But these solutions that are going to uh, help limit the disruption uh, in the Central Valley as it relates to water are going to be solved on the ground or found on the ground. Um, and I'll say the, um, the developers or the, or the architects of Sigma deserve a lot of credit. They developed a framework where uh, locals maintain uh, authority and responsibility over their own resource. And that's kind of a departure uh, from the way that uh, the state has, has formed water policy in the past. Uh, and so as you know, uh, essentially requires local communities, local water agencies, governments to form their own groundwater management agencies, um, understand the resource, understand what they need to do to get back into balance and develop their own plans. Uh, and it's the state government that provides resources, funding, uh, technical support, uh, resources for things like facilitation in the formation of these, of these agencies. So I think the, the, the key lesson that was built into Sigma, but I think we have to continue to acknowledge, is just the fact that the solutions will be found on the ground. And the question is, what can we do at the state to empower the locals to find those solutions? Karen, you've been engaged from the start. In fact, I know because you and I have worked together with a partnership for the I'm San Joaquin Valley. I'm old. Go ahead and no, say it. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm talking about experience in this particular case. But nothing to do with. Uh, but we've we've been through a lot uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, and I know then you have a, a deep place in your heart for it because of agriculture. So, what do you see in terms of the ongoing efforts in the new administration and its ability to help uh, in the San Joaquin Valley in particular? Well, first, I want to echo everything that Wade said and give a special shout out to PPIC. Um, it's just, I know it's a coincidence, but I kept saying from the very beginning when you launched the water program, thank heavens for PPIC launching it because of the credibility and the multi-dimensional approach that you bring to it with so many different kinds of experts. And I wish I could have been on some of those van rides when I heard you had people like Jeff Mout and yourself and Jay Lund and others in white vans going up and down the valley to really dig in and learn. because. That um, just shows the importance and the respect for what the Valley produces for the rest of us and the rest of the world. So I want to thank you for doing that. Um, lessons learned. Well, clearly, um, connecting with locals and listening to locals and making sure that Sigma provided for locally driven solutions. But that has to be partnered with technical assistance, financial incentives, financial support for facilitation, um, and then looking at at the big picture of what comes out of these plans, where there are those patterns that can, that can be most ripe for investment, supposing that in the future there will be other water bonds in particular. Um, and I think also understanding um, the impacts are different in different areas, but wherever we can find multi-benefits of the approach that we take will be absolutely critical. So I'm an optimist by nature. You have to be uh, when you're in farming. 
Mm -hmm. uh, one of my friends says, we, we talk pessimistically, but if you look at the risk we take, we live very optimistically. Um, I see several things that are happening on the ground that we also started to see at the end of the drought, and that is new partnerships and unusual allies. And I think what we're seeing right now and understanding the land implications and where the water's going to be short is you've got NGOs and UC experts and landowners and water agencies and disadvantaged communities all at the table understanding that we're all going to be impacted by this. It's our economy, it's our environment, it's our way of life. How do we work together to come up with solutions? How do we do mapping to really understand the best places there is going to be disruption? It's inevitable that there will be some acreage that will be fallowed. But putting right up at front, where else could we achieve some environmental benefits with that land, with a little bit of water, whatever it might be? I think that's huge. And I think we're building coalitions and partnerships that will lead to durable solutions in very creative ways. Um, one of the most durable solutions will be as the environmental justice community and agriculture continue to partner on finding drinking water solutions. I think that also bodes well for what we can do on the land. Um, if I were a county supervisor, I'd probably be as nervous as anybody else is just thinking about my property tax base um, and also thinking about land use decisions going forward because I would suggest that some of our drinking water problems and other issues have been perhaps by not being rigorous in our land use planning and making sure where communities have popped up. I also look at our climate change <coughs> investment fund and what we're already funding for agriculture um, and how that could also produce some very helpful, beneficial programs to incorporate SIGMA, for example, into our statewide water efficiency enhancement program that we are investing in converting flood to more precision irrigation. After our first year, we asked people not to take out their flood delivery system because we know that for recharge, we need to have that infrastructure there if we really want to manage all of these uh, together. So disruption is going to be significant, but we do have the power, and I think we have the support from the state at this point, to make sure the tools are provided, the fin financial resources will be there. Um, and I would end on where I think the most important work is next, Ellen. This is a big hint, Ellen. <laughs> um, I honestly think to really have Sigma be as successful as it can be, we need to put more investment into understanding the economic impact as well as the economic benefit of recharge and work as rapidly as we can with a lot of lawyers in the room. Sorry to all my friends who are lawyers to understand some property right aspect to that, I think that will unleash recharge opportunities on private lands um, that will actually benefit water quality as well as water availability, mm. and that we need to do that sooner rather than later. Um, there are farmers in the valley now that have seen what they thought were iron tight surface water rights that were iron tight, and they've seen an erosion of that over the last 50 years. So the sooner we can better identify the legal <coughs> rights aspect of if I recharge groundwater, how much can I rightfully expect back will really help drive this. It will make our trading system much more robust and long lasting. And I would just encourage that that be the next place for PPIC to do some work. Thank you. Uh, Tom, uh, we have a new farm bill. And, and we know how helpful that the NRCS in particular was uh, during the last drought, uh, as well as all the other coordination that went on with FSA and the other parts of the, uh, the department. Um, wh what do you see coming out of either the new Farm Bill or the ability to help with some of the issues that we've already discussed? Very good. Well, I do want to start by echoing Wade and Karen in, uh, in my accolades for the, for the work the PPIC has done and, uh, and, and this global approach. And, and also thank you for, for having NRCS on this panel. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, California is a place of partnerships and, and we are very uh, happy to be at the table here. Um, when it comes to the new farm bill, of course, a lot of that is, um, is still kind of on the drawing board, right? It's, it's a federal statute that was passed, and so there's rulemaking and there's uh, regulations that have to be assigned to all the new stipulations, and then we'll slowly be rolling those out, you know, hopefully by next fall. 
Um, but, you know, when you look back on um, what we have been able to do, um, you know, I look back on 2012 and, and look at where we are now, and, and we've learned a lot. And, and I do feel like with the resources we've had in the Farm Bill and the resources that will continue um, in the Farm <coughs> Bill, that, that we've been able to really practice uh, a, a good amount of adaptive management, right, in, in, in our approaches. Um, you know, NRCS has traditionally looked at water, um, you know, Ellen, Ellen portrayed it really well in one of her slides, in, as water efficiency, right? And um, so we're trying, to, we're trying to make systems more efficient, we're trying to produce more crop per drop, right? Um, and what we found, you know, over the drought was that, um, you know, we needed to take a broader, more holistic um, look to that, and, and and I think we've been able to do that in some ways, and 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 I think that'll continue with some of the new uh, provisions in the new farm bill. If you look at um, some of them, um, that that really that really shine is the flexibilities with the RCPP program, the Regional Conservation Partnership program, that really has some new flexibilities built into it, um, and our ability to work with partners and prioritize local issues. Um, and then also are some of the provisions under the EQIP program, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, that allows us to uh, really target um, source water um, areas, source water uh, priority areas, and perhaps pay a higher percentage of financial assistance um, to those areas and, and work with our state partners to focus on that when it comes to our assistance. So I think there's, there, there's a lot um, that the new Farm Bill will have to offer and um, really building upon you know, some of the gains we've made and the lessons we've learned, um, I, I'm looking forward to the challenges. Thank you. Um, the, the governor came out of the gate pretty quick with an investment in terms of an idea that we wanted to solve some of the problems. And one of the priorities up there and one of the first ones he addressed was the notion of clean drinking water, for, especially for disadvantaged communities. So the next question is a little tougher. And that is, how is that vision taking shape in terms of policy for both Wade and Karen? How are we going to get the things done that were on the prior list, whether it's drinking water, the vision for uh, environmental sustainability, and a sustainable water supply for agriculture and the economy? Where, where are we? Yeah, well, let me step back at the highest level and observe that, you know, in the governor's state of the state uh, speech, he made clear, one, his priority on water, and then two, his priority on the Central Valley. Um, and since then, he's actually followed through uh, on both. And I think he's been in the Central Valley now five or six times since he took office. Um, so it's, there's no doubt that, that we'll prioritize the issues around impacts uh, of you know, uh, water-related impacts in the Central Valley. Um, and then more broadly, uh, trying to structure uh, state policy and investments to uh, build a stronger water future in California. So that, that much is known. The governor has been very clear that uh, top of the priority list is ensuring that Californians have clean and safe drinking water. You know, tonight, um, one million Californians, upwards of a million Californians will go home. They may leave work, pick up their kids from daycare, and they'll go back to a home uh, where they can't drink the water coming out of their tap. Uh, and in many cases, bathe their kids with that water, nor uh, cook or clean their dishes with that water. A million Californians, you know, one out of every 38 or 40 Californians, fifth largest economy in the world, some of the most affluent communities on the planet our state has, and yet a million people live in third world conditions. That's a fact. That's not debatable. No one will debate that fact. Um, so Governor Newsom has said very clearly, this, we, we can't countenance this. This is untenable. We have to do something about it. Um, he has embraced a solution, a shared solution, um, developed from a really uncommon coalition that Karen referenced, uh, agricultural leaders and environmental justice uh, organizations coming together uh, for a solution. About $140 million a year is needed to pay for the operations and maintenance of pollution treatment in our poorest communities. Um, and in this proposal, about $30 million comes from agriculture in the form of an increased fertilizer tax and a surcharge on livestock production. Agriculture has stepped up and acknowledged that um, nitrate contamination is a problem in many groundwater uh, basins, and 
uh, uh, independent analysis suggested that about 30 million of the $140 million uh, annual problem is agriculture. So they've stepped up. And the other 110 million would be generated from a small consumer surcharge on my and your water bill, um, capped at 95 cents uh, per month. Um, folks making under 200% of the poverty level wouldn't have to pay this surcharge. And ideally in our vision, it's a small uh, line on your water bill that says state mandated clean and safe drinking water fund. Um, we think that's a good idea. We understand it can be controversial because it gets positioned as a water tax. The governor said he's all ears uh, for other solutions um, that actually solve the problem. There have been a lot of different suggestions, but we are committed to actually solving the problem. Interestingly, the state and state voters have been very generous with the, with the bonds that they provided um, over the years. So we have funding for capital investment in this pollution control technology, but we don't have funding for the operations and maintenance. Lastly, the vast majority of systems that are failing that can't provide uh, this clean and safe drinking water are very small systems um, that in many cases should either improve and essentially be brought up to being able to provide clean and safe drinking water or be consolidated or regionalized. Um, so it's not just about providing funding to failing agencies, it's about consolidating failing agencies where appropriate. Um, it's both governance and funding. Um, we're really excited that the legislative leadership is very clear that they are, uh, they are prioritizing this problem. And we remain optimistic that leaders uh, here, um, I guess a couple blocks uh, to the south in the Capitol can actually get it done to find a solution this year. Anything you'd add? Yeah, I think you covered it well. <laughs> I'm not going to let you off that easy. I'm watching, my, I'm, I'm watching my friends from the legislature okay. get up and leave. Alf is leaving, so he's offended. <laughs> he's getting Alf. seconds. We didn't mean to call you out. Got to go back and work on that. All right, make that happen, will you? Uh, I think that one of the challenges that was identified, though, is do we have the right mix of institutional and organizational processes ready? to accept help. What are, what are some of the challenges remaining to do that? You mentioned one, and that is how do we aggregate small systems right. in a way that makes sense? But that crosses all the boundaries in terms of the water issues, whether it's Sigma, it's uh, uh, the environment. Uh, or do we have the right mix? And what would you suggest we need to do to look at our situation in the Valley to make it a lot more amenable to the solutions? You want me to say something controversial? That, controversial, I mean, it's not Absolutely. just small drinking water systems, but look at the thousands of very small irrigation districts and water agencies generally. When you think about overhead and duplication, I think we have to be intellectually honest and examine, um, are they all still necessary in the right solution? And I think the, the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act um, is going to cause people to ask questions about, can we afford this particular infrastructure now? It has served us very well, but is this really the investment for the future to have the numbers that are out there? I'm just asking the question, and if they're out there, um, how do we put them into the framework, which I really appreciate DWR's 2018 water plan update that puts an emphasis on green infrastructure. What are they doing to manage water and move water? And uh, what are they doing for habitat? And what are they doing that could be part of the solution for drinking water? And I would add, wow, since we have them all out there and there's going to be a lot more monitoring and measuring, what are they doing to help bring broadband to rural areas to make sure that we can use all the technology we need? My state board member, Joyce Sterling, would be so proud of me for finding a way to put broadband into this conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Tom? I hope you have some experience from other part of the country because the third leg that we talk about is environmental sustainability. And as pointed out by Ellen, some of the best stewards are farmers for the environment. And the question then is, do we also have the right institutional arrangements to bring them into the mix to solve some of the sustainability problems that we're facing, uh, uh, whether it's under Sigma or in general that impact water supply? So what do they do in other places, for example? That's a good question. Um, you know, and, and um, you know, when we when we look at um, you know some of the solutions, um, say that they're looking at in the Midwest, they're looking a lot at healthy soils, right? 
Um, and, and that's something, I, I know I beat you to the punchline. I know, line, and I was, was going to save it for my punchline. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and, um, and and that's something that, you know, in, in partnership with CDFA and many different partners, UCA and R, we've been looking at for quite a while because you look at, um, you know, really resilience to climate change, right? You look at resilience to be, you know, highly variable climates and water supplies, then having that soil basis, um, you know, provides, you know, a, a buffer for a landowner, for a farmer to be able to really, to really be able to farm sustainably. And, and from this subject, you look at the water supply part of that, um, you look at a lot more of the water coming into the ground, you look at a lot more, um, water percolating deep um, made plant available rather than rather than running off and so I think it's an untapped reservoir of, of storage I guess you could say when you look at the soils and you look at really healthy soils and building some of that in as opposed to um, you know having a lot of the the water kind of shed and run off um, the other things that you know I you know I feel like we should look at some of the things we've done here, right, and, and some of the accomplishments we've had here um, in, in, in the holistic use of water and, and looking at water um, as a whole system, water management rather than necessarily just um, increased efficiency. So, you know, there's the use of water for habitat and wildlife rather than, you know, in conjunction with crop pr um, production. So, um, you know, looking at hundreds of thousands of acres of rice fields that are flooded for water birds. And, and we learned that lesson during the drought, right? It's like not only um, are farmers hurting, not only are communities hurting, but also, um, you know, a lot of the wildlife that we cherish are hurting. And so we were able to work with our rice farmers to look at a, you know, kind of a broader solution of water management there. And, and I think that's applicable to other, to other uh, um, parts of the state. You know, now, now we're, we're kind of st starting to look at that from the standpoint of raising salmon in rice fields. So we'll see how that works out. Now, along with that, um, you look at something like groundwater recharge, right, in the intersection with Sigma and groundwater recharge, and, and, and partners have been kind of pulling us in that direction. And it goes into, I think, something that, that Karen alluded to, with, which is these multiple systems. We're, we're looking at being able to um, not just put a more efficient micro system or drift system in, but leave the infrastructure to flood because of the multiple uh, benefits, not just for wildlife, but for groundwater recharge. And, and really before the drought, we we're just focusing on putting in the drip and micro systems. And, and so we're adapting to that. And then we're starting to um, go in this direction of, of groundwater recharge, looking at some pilot projects there um, to really look at this broader water management uh, scheme. So. Did I answer your question or did I avoid it? You were asking about other parts of the country. Right? That's quite all right. I, I was talking more about how you can partner and what type of organizations you can partner with. We know there's a historical strong relationship, for example, with resource conservation districts. Yes. But as Ellen pointed out, there's a shortage perhaps in the San Joaquin Valley. Yeah. So can the service and all of the other agents of, of the federal government who can work with other types of agencies in delivering some of the things, or are you tied in some way because of the Farm Bill or rules that you don't have the opportunity to work with a Sonoma County Water Agency or someone like that who's already doing a lot of the environmental stewardship on behalf of their, their landowners. Yes. One of the changes in the Farm Bill, though, with regards to the Regional Conservation Partnership mm -hmm. Program is water districts being eligible to yes. bring in many growers. Yes. Well, we got it out. Program, <laughs> right, so the Regional Conservation Partnership Program is kind of the, the is really the big ticket to look at when it comes to partnerships and, and it's not just you know RCDs are our key traditional partner they're on the ground they're with us but um, but RCPP a, as a program is one that's open for multiple partners to come in and leverage funds a, and we have I think about 26 of those right now within the state um, covering all kinds of different resources from tree mortality to um, to some oak woodland restoration and that sort of thing. So RCPP, and those come out as um, announcements for funding. Um, I, with the new farm bill, I'm not sure if we're going to have a new one this year or not. We're going to have an announcement this year. But it was opened up with a lot more flexibility for partners to really look at innovative approaches. And, and 
you know, I'm looking forward to, to seeing how that takes shape. I, I think it's got a lot of potential. Another one is the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, which, which is run through our sister agency, uh, the Farm Services Agency. And, and that is one, again, where it, it really takes a state entity to come in and apply in partnership with FSA and uh, provide that leveraging of funds on the ground, right? Sometimes as federal agencies, we're a little bit uh, say constrained on how much, how many dollars per acre we get paid for this or that, and so um, both RCPP and CREP are both really opportunities that are open across the board for partnerships to come in and leverage, um, you know, not just in uh, say providing publicity and, and and that sort of thing, but really uh, providing help on the ground and also um, you know matching our cost share and financial assistance. So those are some of the really big opportunities that are out there. Karen and Wade, yeah. you want to? I I just want to be very brief that um, we also have. Um, some very robust results from NGOs, conservation organizations headquartered in San Francisco doing amazing work in the valley. And I have to call out sustainable conservation as just one of many, environmental defense, uh, nature conservancy, and others. Do not overlook the power of those kinds of partnerships because we spend way too much time in this country talking about the rural urban divide and not enough time looking at how codependent we are in one another and that our solutions like being able to do reuse of urban water for recharge for on some crops for whatever it might be. So the power of those kinds of partnerships in addition to our UC Cooperative Extension is still the best when it comes to technical assistance and having credibility, objective information. We this year under our climate change investment portfolio um, have invested in a million dollar contract to put 10 climate change, climate smart agriculture educators at the community level, and Sigma should be a part of that. These are providing public benefit, and it's very rational to use limited public dollars to get that kind of resource available. I would add that one of the tricks, I think, of implementing Sigma effectively is groundwater management agencies learning from each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you have 143 uh, groundwater management agencies, and many of them are building really interesting models, uh, like those that Ellen referred to, in terms of water trading, incentivizing recharge. Um, and so one of the challenges, I think, is everyone's, well, the, the most depleted basins are moving towards submitting their groundwater sustainability plans by January. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's an effort to learn from one another, uh, but it's challenging because everyone has obviously a pretty aggressive timeline to develop their first plans. I'll say that the, the, the work doesn't stop with the submission of the GSP. Um, really, there will be evolving over time. And I think as a state, you know, the Department of Water Resources you know, has $160 million you know, available to continue mm -hmm. to provide these groundwater management agencies. But how, how, how can we at the state recognize or help recognize, identify, elevate what's working well in certain groundwater management agencies so other groundwater management agencies can actually emulate that. If I could add one more sure. without talking too much. I, I didn't drink any coffee before this to try to <laughs> make sure that I only talked my share. But um, one other way that we've really moved out on some of this is partnerships for technical assistance, mm -hmm. right? So we've traditionally partnered with resource conservation districts through agreements to leverage funds for actually on the ground assistance. Um, we've been moving toward competing more and more of those. So for example, in, in tree mortality, um, we have agreements with California Association of uh, Conservation Districts, American Forestry Foundation, Monterey County uh, Resource Conservation Districts um, to leverage our funds with theirs to actually provide foresters on the ground where we can't necessarily have the agility to, to respond with, with staffing. Uh, we've partnered with Point Blue to do about a half dozen, have a, about a half dozen different biologists on the ground to, to look at um, you know, providing biological assistance, Xerces Society, um, UCANR for agronomists and stuff like, and, and that sort of thing. So, so we're also looking at that um, avenue through technical assistance and leveraging the funds that way. Okay, last question, and this is a surprise for everybody. Oh, goody. <laughs> I got a good one for you. <clears throat> this silver tsunami, where are we going to get the technical support and the leadership for dealing with the issues, and what are your agencies all doing to help in address that particular issue? Well, I'm really proud of Carla Namath and Department of Water Resources that are tackling the issue head on. Um, regarding Sigma, um, they're focused on getting more um, uh, geo 
what geohydrologists? No, hydrological geologists. Yes. Hydrological geologists uh, uh, on staff. Raise your hand if you're from DWR. All right, good. Am I getting that right? That's um, close enough. enough. Um, because you know we're the last state in the West to uh, manage groundwater, regulate groundwater, and so it hasn't been a competence uh, that's really resident in um, the really expert people at DWR who have been um, more focused on managing and planning water infrastructure above ground. Um, so one is you know staffing up to make sure that we can actually review these groundwater sustainability plans, provide the technical assistance. But then more broadly, really looking at uh, DWR's uh, workforce and really uh, focus and target uh, bringing in the new generation of leaders. Uh, and that's happening. Um, and you know, every year we lose talented people um, mm -hmm. from state government who bring, you know, leave with, take with them so much institutional memory. Um, so we have to focus on bringing in the, the new generation. I'm excited that DWR is focused on that, but of course there's more work to do. Thank you. Karen? So I have no statutory authority to talk about anything I just talked about. So that's kind of like puts me at a, at a you know, behind the eight ball with what Wade can do. Uh, however, the intersection with agriculture is critical and I'm very pleased that I have this chance to serve Governor Newsom and the people of California to bring this agricultural perspective and the possibilities of partnering with private landowners to create the economy that we all want the great food supply that we all enjoy, and the environmental benefits, and do it in a way that every Californian can benefit, not just some. So I, as an advocate, working with my sister agencies to bring that perspective in a very effective way, which is about, we can't do that. No, that's not our way. Our way is, there are some alternatives, and have you thought about this? So we stood up a new unit at the Department of Food and Agriculture when I started there eight years ago, the Office of Environmental Farming and Innovation. And that's really what is housing all of our climate smart agricultural programs. And that's where I hope that we will have an opportunity partnering with DWR and the Resources Agency and EPA and the State Water Resources Control Board to really, should there be investment streams that we have an opportunity to help direct them in ways that will work on the land to keep good jobs in rural communities um, to get the kind of environmental benefits that we want and to make sure that drinking water is available for other people who live and work and play in the Central Valley and other rural areas. People, too. Tom, people what is the federal government doing on hiring people? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Should I, can I answer your previous question first, then I'll talk oh, about yeah. hiring people? Either one? Either. You know, um, in our, you know we, we used to think that we knew everything. Um, it's kind of an interesting uh, paradigm to look back on, <laughs> but you know, I think you know, 25, 30 years ago, we re really thought we knew a lot, a and you know, slowly over time, we've hit the continuum where we find that as we know more, we know less and less, right? A and um, and part of what that really um, forces us and/or allows us to do is to kind of step, take a step back, and, and look honestly at what expertise we have and don't have, right? So when it comes to uh, agronomy, range management, you know, forestry and that kind of thing, um, water efficiency in, in the engineering realm, you know, we've got those things down. A and, and then we got to look at the hiring end of it to, make, to look at, you know, how we can make sure we can have the adequate staff to address that. But then when it comes, you know, the, the wonderful thing about being in California, working in California, is, is that there are so many cutting edge issues and so many partners with cutting edge information. You know, groundwater recharge is of course one of those, right? Where um, that's one thing that we've had to take a step back and say, you know, we really don't know when it comes to this. This is not, it's not really in our wheelhouse. And so we're really looking at um, working with partners on that to have the research and, and kind of understand um, what's going to happen, you know, because we're used to working on a farm by farm basis, right? And so if you look at it, individual farmers contract, if you flood that for groundwater recharge, where does the water go? What are the ramifications, right? Um, and, and so we have partners that can kind of help fill in those gaps. And then also we're, we're, you know, through things like RCPP and then also our small watershed program, we're taking a step back from that farm by farm approach and kind of opening that up to look at things more on the basin-wide basis, which is actually kind of what we used to do back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and, and groundwater, of course, requires that, right? It requires a basin-wide approach so that you know um, what you're doing and, and you know if you're actually 
uh, having a solution instead of just making yourself feel good. So those things uh, are things that, that we, we, we rely completely on for partners when it comes to that kind of thing. And Sigma, I think, is a really good um, avenue for that because these local institutions that are being built up are, are really um, do, doing a lot of this local planning and our challenge is going to be kind of working with that, integrating with that and, and, and leveraging with that. So I, I think there's some real good opportunities in that way. Okay, very good. We're a couple of minutes ahead, but I think we're at a time where we could probably stop and open up the questions and answers for everybody. You get a couple extra minutes to be able to give us a uh, shout. So, already, question right over there for the panel. And make sure and use the uh, microphone close because this is going out on a webcast. How's this? Is it okay? Very good. My name is Shirley Darling. I grew up in Nebraska. I totally agree with all of the urgency with agriculture and the water and everything. I have a different concern as well. When we were having the drought, many of the rural citizens were having depression, having anxiety, the wells were drying up, there were many suicides, and there aren't enough mental health workers or support for volunteer agencies like NAMI. There needs to be part of the budget that takes care of the physical and mental health needs, you know, I know mothers were diluting their f baby formula with water that really wasn't acceptable. And that's a very stressful thing right there. So I'd like you to comment on if you know how to make that a little slice of the pie. Well, I'll just acknowledge, you know, your point, which is these crises, be they, you know, drought or flood or wildfire, have mental health impacts on the victims. Um, the, the more acute uh, crises like a wildfire or like a flood or like an earthquake that have a really time limited window band tend to have really focused mental health services where people come in and are actually working with victims. And for example, in the recent campfire who lost their homes. Um, and that's actually part of the emergency response. The drought has proven far trickier because it's a slow motion disaster that happens over years. And so it was interesting. We were trying to adapt an emergency management response model um, that's really focused on very acute time limited crises to this slow moving crisis. And I would just say that um, you know, I, I just accept your point that we have to figure out how to provide um, those mental health services to the victims of drought, recognizing it's a really long time window. Um, so the onset of, of mental health issues, depression, may be slower and harder to detect, and also the provision of service might have to last for a longer period of time. Um, so I'll just take that back as a, as a really good comment for us to work on in terms of drought preparation. Karen, why don't you remind us again why broadband is so important for things like <laughs> well, telemedicine? I, I was, I mean, well, and I was going to say, um, there's an isolation of living in rural, sparsely populated places. I know that because I grew up in the middle of nowhere in western Nebraska, and I could see Wyoming from there. Um, and so there's just not the infrastructure that's there, and the sense of isolation or not having jobs or a good prospect for the future. You lose hope, which is why we have the opioid crisis that we do in many, many rural areas. And so this investment, understanding that every scientific decision we make or the technology that advances, we need to incorporate the social science element of everything that we're doing. How do we bring people together to create solutions that work for everyone at the table? And I think that Governor Newsom has demonstrated his commitment to that. Um, and that broadband for telemedicine, for workforce development, for education. Students who are asked to use computers at school shouldn't have to have their parents drive them to a McDonald's parking lot, which we've heard over and over at the state board, to do their homework on a computer. Like, if you're connected to the world, at least you see some opportunities and you can accomplish some things you wouldn't otherwise. So I think there's many dimensions to it, Sarge. Mm. Do you have anything to add to that, Tom, in response? I mean, you, the Rural Health Service is Part of which agency? I don't think it's yours. <laughs> yeah. No, aside from the fact that, that I, I fully recognize it, it's a crucial issue. Um, it's... Uh, Any it's, more questions? There's several. 
<laughs> oh, Vern. Vern. Yes, I can. <laughs> Vernon Crowder, I know this issue is not at the forefront of thought right now, but I believe it's going to be a very serious issue in the San Joaquin Valley. And that's namely, what are we going to do with this fallowed acreage, be it mm -hmm. short term or especially for long term? This acreage, unless managed correctly, can end up being a major pest problem. It can be a major source of evasive species, weeds, or just simply an eyesore. What agencies or, you know, who's going to oversee what's invested or how these fallowed acreage are managed? So, Vernon, I don't think it's not a front burner issue. If you look at the collaboration that's happening with water districts and partnering with Nature Conservancy and others, it's really understanding what ground is best suited for fallowing, but that should never be bare ground. And so I think NRCS has a role to play of what some options might be available for that. And there's, I have not heard anyone talk about just abandoning it and leaving it because that harms the entire community. So I think there's a lot of thought going into that particular land use element of the decisions that people are making and understanding, is it is it suited for solar? Is it suited for uh, habitat? I know, Ellen, your study has identified a number of acres that could be. It's not going to take up all of that. But I think there's tremendous thought going into if there is going to be fallowing, what happens to it next? and trying to prevent it from just being bare, abandoned soils. I'll yeah. add just the, the reality check was the pie graph that Ellen showed. I mean, yeah. I think I would acknowledge your point, which is there's already a lot of good thinking around um, how to use the, those, that acreage differently in ways that generate benefit, including a revenue stream for the owner of the property. But less than half of, uh, of, of the acreage has really de been deemed pot as potential for that sort of multi-benefit already identified practice, according to PPIC. So then the question is, well, boy, how does, you know, how does the rest of that acreage get treated? Right. And I think it's tricky because it's, you know, land use is a local issue, right. and particularly right. a county-by-county county issue. So it's really interesting to know, if is there a model for some type of um, multi-county uh, entity that PPIC uh, referred to that, that would be at all feasible? Or is it working county by county and the state providing resources for counties to plan? Um, to me, there's a lot of good uh, examples on the ground of the reuse of fallowed land for other benefits, mm -hmm. but it's not achieving the scale um, with which we probably need to achieve. Right. Yeah, I think there's a couple of, uh, a couple of avenues that have potential um, first off, recognizing, you know, the difficulty of getting actual cover established on some of this ground, right? In, in the really arid regions and, and the land that's been farmed and fallowed um, and using that in a way that really conserves water, right? Rather than, um, rather than using a lot of water to, to get plants established. I, I think it's, it's a really strong technical challenge. We do have our plant materials center that's looking at some of that right now and looking at ways to try to uh, provide some restoration options. Um, and, and, you know, looking at short-term restoration, right, say as part of a rotation where it's followed is, is of course going to be different. You know, then you're looking more cover crops, trying to get some kind of short-term cover established as opposed to longer term where you've got to, you know, really logically look at trying to get some introduction of some kind of a native species complex. And, and, and doing that in these highly altered landscapes is, is going to be a, a strong technical challenge and, and one that, that um, I think need, there needs to be a lot of resources invested into. Yeah. Uh, programmatically, right, as far as assistance for an individual landowner, that Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program that was mentioned um, is a really good avenue for a state-federal partnership, and, and I think that needs to be explored. Um, and those, you know, that, that tends to be longer-term contracts, so you're looking at uh, 10 to 15 years of having land put into some kind of vegetative cover for habitat and soil health. Um, and then the environmental quality incentives program would be more for shorter term, you know, a year to two years, three years, something like that. Um, so I think that there are resources out there, um, but it, it's going to be a challenge to really make it. I've got to stick productive. a shout out for the UCs and CSUs to help with plant research as well. I can't tell you how many inquiries we've had about industrial hemp. Oh, God, don't get me started on that. I won't go That's there. But, yeah. but there was other plant yeah, materials that we can pro plant. perhaps to discuss in the future that might be able to be used on those kinds of lands. Uh, question of Withers Cove here. 
Hi, I'm Brad Hooker from AgriPulse, California, and uh, I was going to ask about the budget. So with the state agencies, you know, it's nice to say that we can provide grants and incentives for farmers, but what we're seeing right now is a lot of money getting swept up into wildfire funding for prevention and responses. I know with the cap and trade budget, uh, the dairy digester program lost a lot of funding from that too. That's so. proposed budget. We have proposed, may revise yeah. to look out for, who knows? <laughs> but yeah, that's my question. How are you going to respond to that with uh, these lo larger overarching climate change issues that are going to take the thunder from a lot of this for farmers? Yeah, I mean, we have to do, we have to fund, you know, all of these challenges at once with finite resources. You know, we're, we're focused on my agency intensely on protecting the most vulnerable communities mm -hmm. before the, the height of the next wildfire season. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been a lot of resources directed towards that given, you know, 27, 2017, uh, 2018, worst wildfire seasons or years by far in terms of destruction, loss of life, et cetera. So it can't be an or, it has to be an and. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really thankful to the voters of California for passing Prop 68 last June. Um, that, will, that will actually allocate or has allocated $150 million for Sigma implementation. So I think we have to be smart about trying to maximize resources uh, and, and help them be as effective as possible for all of these different threats. And it's important to note that it's the first bond ever that provided incentive program dollars uh, for our Healthy Soils program and for our statewide, statewide water use efficiency program. So I think that bodes well for the future. It's that, that shifting that thinking to green infrastructure. It's not just built infrastructure. Green infrastructure is going to be a huge component of our future in trying to solve these issues. I will mention, though, you know, one of the things that, that large governments do is build infrastructure. And so when we're talking about helping move water around the valley, conveyance. I do want to acknowledge the need for modernized conveyance. We always, that, usually that's a euphemism for a tunnel or a tunnel proposals under the delta. But in this case, it's yeah. really about moving water right. um, through the valley. And I'm amazed by those bar charts that suggest yes. the difference economic impact you can have if you enable flexibility, particularly you know, regional flexibility beyond just within basins. Mm -hmm. But that's going to require investment. Yeah. And so that's the type of big thinking that state government yeah. needs to do. Yeah. So the trading system, whatever it may look like, is going to have to have that kind of infrastructure built Right. Up or else it's going to be very small, right. limited impact right. trading systems. Interconnection of the systems. Yeah, that was one of our major findings yes. in the report. More questions? Everybody must have meetings they had to go to. Sorry. I'm, I'm inferring that your funding is reliant on state sources rather than federal. Is that correct? This is federal. Uh, I'm federal, yeah, through the federal farm bill. Yeah. <laughs> but you're collaborating. So this is, the, I mean, the problem is is a uh, isn't just uh, conservation yeah. it's agriculture and so to what extent is this re are you are you going to be dependent on federal as well as state funding to do the work you're set out to do well i think the real art is weaving together the different sources of funding um, and so having committed partners from the federal government on the ground in california mm -hmm. is critical I mean, the, the Farm Bill is how, how many billions dollars? Oh, jeez. I mean, it's enormous. It's a lot. It's enormous. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, and, and and it's more. Yes. Um, but that's because and, but, of the SNAP program, so let's say. Right. But, point, but point being. Um, yeah, e Equip is two to three billion. Yeah, remarkable yeah. resources, mm -hmm. strong resources at the state. Some of the local management agencies are, will raise their own resources as well. I think one of the things we need to do at the state, and Karen's uh, department does this really well, is um, help translate all of this alphabet soup of programs so that it can actually help local communities, local agricultural producers. And of course, UA USDA does that too with people on the ground. But it's really, it can't be one or the other, state or federal. It's got to be both. And I think Santa Clara County, what they did last year with passing a bond that was about land use and preserving farmland as part of flood control, conservation. Um, I think that's an example that we may see other counties decide that that's the way of our future too for something that's local driven for local solutions. Mm. Yeah. Got time for one more question. Nothing burning out there, Everything. huh? Oh, kidding. Fran. Oh, Fran, uh-oh, look out. <laughs> yeah. And it's for, it's, it's, uh, it was raised by Karen. Uh, the, um, the question is, is 
the governor's office or uh, or its agencies, mm -hmm. or is anyone in the legislature actually looking at water rights revision? Karen. So <laughs> I, I was using the example of farmers who have, have felt the erosion of their current or historical water rights. I don't know of anyone that's taking on water rights reform writ large, but I think water rights for groundwater, which has not been talked about, having an understanding and the certainty of a property owner, if I put water into the ground, which I don't have control, total control over, how do I know what I can take back out? And if we could figure that kind of a legal structure out to give certainty to a trading system or whatever, I think that's going to be critical to really unleashing all that's possible for on-farm recharge in addition to what the districts are doing with larger scale water banking itself. That's my personal opinion. Not a lawyer, not an economist, it's therefore easy for me to make that kind of a declaration. <laughs> and I would just say that um, I think everybody acknowledges that if we were creating a system out of whole cloth, um, we might not have the, the, the same water right system. Um, but it, you know, it's a third rail issue, and it's a third rail issue because people have invested their lives and their properties over generations in, in water rights that, um, that they depend on. Our approach in the Newsom administration, at least early on, is, uh, is not to uh, you know, take that on, but to actually try to find more collaborative models where we can actually um, figure out how to program, share water for the benefit of agriculture communities and the environment. Um, the challenge is doing that in scarcity. Um, so, you know, the voluntary agreements, Secretary Babbitt is here and, uh, in town today, and he led an effort uh, and really got us to where we are right now with the voluntary agreements, which is trying to bring water users and environmental groups and the state departments together to really figure out, okay, how can we ensure that there's enough water in these river systems uh, to, uh, to comply with state and federal law and protect species that are in danger of extinction while working to limit water uncertainty. The same farmers that are very anxious and worried about sigma are also very anxious and worried about uh, curtailments mm -hmm. of their surface water from, um, from uh, the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers. This is really tough. Um, and we actually think though the only way forward is to try to break out, the governor talked about it as breaking out of these binaries. Mm -hmm. You know, it cannot be farmers versus environmentalists. From my perspective, north versus south, urban versus rural. We have to figure out a way to meet needs as best we can across all of the different needs. Well said. Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attendance today. And I'd like to thank the panel. If I could have a hand for them, please, for a job well done. Are there any further messages that we need to pass along today? Fill out your survey. Fill out your survey. Thank you very much again. <laughs>